Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Vice President, CES and Corporate Business Strategy for the Consumer Technology Association, Karen Chupka. Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us here on day two of CES. We're so pleased that we brought you the sunshine today. <laughs> Our show continues to expand and push boundaries and break records. And this year, we're proud to host 170,000 attendees, including 3,900 exhibitors and 900 startups in our Eureka Park area alone. Major brands from across the tech ecosystem are all here at CES. This includes 76% of Fortune 100 companies and 93% of Interbrand's best global brands. Our C-Space program is a special conference for advertisers, marketers, uh, content providers, and Hollywood. And they come together at CES to discuss how tech and digital advertising are changing and impacting global marketing strategies. Today, we're, here to, we're delighted here to hear this keynote about how content, is changing, uh, how content distribution is changing the landscape of the media, marketing, advertising, and entertainment world. This discussion is going to be moderated by MediaLink Chairman and CEO Michael Casson. And as many of you know, Michael is an internationally recognized business strategist. He helps bridge the gaps between media marketers, technologies, entertainment executives, and investors. So please join me in welcoming Michael Casson to the stage. Thank you, Karen. Based on your opening, I guess I'm sunshine. I don't know, you said you brought sunshine. But uh, welcome. Yes, I have seen the future. And it's streaming live on our phones. By all accounts, the future is video, live video, 360-degree video, video mapping, square video, VR video, social video, short-form video, direct-to-consumer video, the population is collectively consuming one billion hours of YouTube videos every single day. The videos posted online every minute would take the average person two years to watch. Video is clearly the king and the queen. But as we know, the kingdom is a labyrinth. No matter how you define TV and view video viewership, people seem to tweak the definition to make the stats more favorable. We are witnessing the end of the world as we knew it. The trends are all over the place. According to Nielsen, 96.5% of American households were TV households this past fall, an increase of 1.4 million homes from the fall of 2016. According to another source, TV video content consumption is down more than 10% since 2012. The translation? More people than ever are watching television, but they're not watching it via a set-top box. Some table stakes. As we know, Gen Y isn't buying cable and satellite subscriptions as they used to. They rely on YouTube and the Internet. In fact, 49% of the population watches video content on laptops, tablets, and smartphones. In the social sphere, 90% of Twitter videos are viewed through a mobile device. In October, Instagram Stories had 300 million daily active users worldwide. That number was 200 million in April. We are experiencing the 21st century version of the Wild Kingdom. Linear TV seems on occasion to be gasping for breath, and other times seems as healthy as ever. Snapchat killed Vine, and several headlines this year suggest that Instagram is in the process of killing Snapchat. Mobile phones and tablets are eating laptops and desktops for lunch. As Alice said on the other side of the looking glass, it's getting curiouser and curiouser. Rendering this video conundrum even further confusing is the fact that human attention is still an extremely finite resource. People have an average attention span of about eight seconds, which puts a massive amount of pressure on storytelling, relevance, and value. One thing is clear. It will be fascinating to see where the creators and marketers take video in 2018 leveraging the unfathomable combination of new technology and rapid consumer affinity for immersive trends, all complicated by people's limited tolerance for any content that doesn't enhance their daily journey. 
For those of us who rely on video for entertainment or to build a brand or to reach an audience, there is a huge question that needs to be answered. And in Las Vegas, what better place to ask this question? Where do we place our bets? Today's conversation has been carefully curated to unpack that challenge and learn from an array of doers and seers in the best way forward. I'm going to kick off the exchange with two people who make their living by predicting and pursuing the future of content and content distribution. A bit later, Wendell Millard is going to lead a lively discussion with leaders who are building brands and businesses in the midst of all the chaos. First, let me introduce, introduce David Zaslav and R.A.A. Burkhoff. David is the CEO and president of Discovery Communications, where he oversees the company's global suite of media brands across platforms. He is credited with building Discovery's international footprint and superfan brands, including ID and OWN, and diversifying Discovery to include Eurosport, the home of the Olympics across Europe. David has led Discovery's digital pivot, creating short-form leader Group 9 along with Ben Lear, and as well the Eurosport player streaming service, TV Everywhere service, Go and 10. REA Burkhoff is the founder and CEO of LionTree, a global TMT investment and merchant banking firm. Since its formation in 2012, LionTree has applied its deep sector expertise in advising clients on over $300 billion of industry-shaping transactions, including, I might add, representing MediaLink in its sale to Essential in February of 2017. Obviously a very small part of that $300 billion, but thank you anyway. Let's welcome R.A. and David and let's dive in. So to kick things off, guys, I, I'm, I'm going to throw out a statement, and then I'd love you to tell me if it's, uh, it's resonant with you, if it's true or false. And as you know, um, this conversation is free flow. So uh, I'm going to start with a question, but I have a feeling there'll be questions going uh, in, in every direction. Can I ask a question before you start? Actually? You can. Um, this man to my left is not only a very powerful media executive, but he may be the most powerful man in this country in dictating our future because he employs Oprah Winfrey. No. I, uh, nobody employs Oprah Winfrey. In fact, I think, I think you have her sign up through 2025 in her latest contract. So I guess we all want to know, would you let her out of the contract in 2020 if you want to run for president? Oprah's in charge of her own destiny, <laughs> <laughs> which so, is good for all of us. I guess take that as a yes, right? I said we were going to dive right in and make some news, so here I'm you go. I'm actually, before we, get, before we get serious, I'm actually pretty happy with this new data that you had about the average attention span of of people today is eight seconds. You know, when I was younger, mine was like eight seconds and people thought I was nuts. <laughs> now here we are all these years later and everybody's attention span is eight seconds. You know, uh, people used to tell me I was the adult <laughs> poster child for ADD. I think that's now a, you know, a badge of honor. So <laughs> we all have it. It's, it's exactly right. <laughs> uh, guys, the economics of television are predicated on a notion that everyone will want to watch more of it. Now that we've collectively seen that people are at least watching less of it in some quarters, what's the best way to prosper? Let's, let's start. What's the best way to go forward? Um, and what's wrong with the statement I made about people watching less or at least paying for less? Well, why don't I start? Uh, I think you made the most important point, which is that people are consuming more content today than they ever have. So if you look at the ecosystem of creative content, IP, storytelling, it's richer now than, it, than it's ever been. You know, there's different strategies. You can see the Disney strategy of coming together with more scale and scripted TV and scripted movies and being able to aggregate that to take on a direct-to-consumer platform as well as a traditional platform. For us, we really see the world as, uh, to the right is all the scripted content, and that's really generated value more by a series um, or a movie and marketing that series and people falling in love with that particular piece of IP, um, we've moved all the way to the left. That's where most of media is. Uh, we've moved to the left, which is nonfiction, which is really enthusiasts and super fan networks. So whether it's Oprah with African Americans, number one, or ID, number one for women uh, in America with crime, discovery, Animal Planet, it's why we did scripts, where we emerged with food and home and garden and, uh, and travel and cooking. And uh, if you actually look at the length of view of nonfiction, on cable, 
It's quite dramatic, and people not only fall in love with the show, but they fall in love with the curation. People that love food,、uh, it, they they feel that food gets me, and they put it on and they watch it all day, or Discovery or ID. And so I think the real trick is,、uh, it's hard when it's a show because the show ends. We think that these brands of superfans that love particular baskets of content, and then take it to them not just around the world, which is which was our game. Over the last 20 years, but now take it to them on all platforms, and also it doesn't have to just be consumable in a half hour, an hour. It could be consumable in smaller bites, and so we think we could take advantage of that ecosystem by following the super fans or the enthusiasts for cars or or science or or food or cooking all around the world and kind of super feed them. So. David, you, you mentioned Scripps, obviously a, a large transaction that's pending and hopefully will close soon.、Um, the year 2017, that was a, a, an important and a watershed、uh, deal. The end of the year, we had a pretty large deal get announced with the, you know, the the Fox、uh, Disney transaction.、Uh, I would say to you, who are the dance partners,、uh, RAA? Who are the dance partners? That you see mashing up in 2018, and I think the question that is on so many people's minds, at least from your perspective, is: Is it likely that we're going to see traditional media acquiring new media, or is it more likely we're going to see new media acquiring traditional media? Well, I think it relates to the answer that David gave to your first question about the economics and the video trend, because. These deals do have relationship to the fundamental opportunities, but also the pressures that the companies are feeling today.、Um, you know, yes, it's a great time to be a creator. The creative side of media is in a renaissance period. We've heard everyone talk about that, and you see it all the time with you know, video、uh, proliferating and many different business models and new companies that are really exciting. At the same time, the business models that exist in the traditional industries don't always align with the consumer behavior. And that is creating a lot of friction. And so, for example, you know, consumers are watching much more video on their mobile devices, probably three times as much as they did even four or five years ago. They're watching、uh, a lot more,、um, you know, content on Snap and Instagram, etc. They're still spending time on other things like audio, even much more than that today.、Um, and yet, the consumers are saying they're only going to watch less than, you know, fewer than ten channels. And so, we're effectively living in this a la carte environment where consumers are demanding things that they want when they want it. And the companies that exist today that have scale, like Discovery or like Disney, or like a lot of the distributors, whether they're technology companies or cable companies or, or telephone companies, those companies have scale. You can preserve the existing models for a lot longer. But there's many other companies today that are very fragmented still, and、um, they're too small. And so they are going to have to find a dance partner. And you either have to go to scale in your existing business, which we call horizontal mergers, or you have to go vertical, where you have to align with a platform that will、um, tailor that content to the consumer in different ways. And that could be exclusive content. I think we're probably moving past an age of non-exclusive content. I think every platform will have their own exclusive content to show clarity to the consumer, and I think that will dictate more vertical mergers. The platforms, whether technology or cable or telco, with content, or a lot more scale with your remaining content companies globally. And for the emerging content companies, you have to have a really good balance sheet, and you have to have a lot of capital to really go all the way with an entrepreneurial boutique-like model today. So we are clearly living in a world where the conversation for years now has been around OTT and skinny bundles. I don't know if we we'd agree on this in this conversation that it's here to stay, but I think we are clearly living in a world. It was played out in politics last year. We're clearly living in an over-the-top world. We're clearly living in a world where delivering the message—you can read whatever you want into this directly to the consumer—has proven effective in the political realm. And we've also seen it proven. And I said this in Europe at the end of last year.、Uh, we, we had a president that was elected、uh, on a skinny bundle. And, and so we've actually seen it play out in the real world. There were three channels that seemed interesting, played those three channels over and over, and、uh, you know, over the top、uh, was successful. The question is, how is that ultimately going to play out for you? I mean, you know, for, for us,、um, the other thing that differentiates us, and it's for this very reason, is we own all of our content on all platforms, everywhere in the world. 
except for Eurosport, our sports content, where we own all of our content on all platforms in all of continental Europe, 750 million people. And so we're, we're IP long. Uh, we're betting that owning the windows for that content globally will give us really unique status. And we are in a unique moment when you look at the, the big players in the market. We grew up with the cable operators and the satellite providers, and they've built domestically and around the world a very healthy business for us. And that's going to remain, we think, for quite a long time. And with our acquisition of Scripps, we think we're going to get a significant amount of growth over the next several years, both in terms of cash flow and, and, and revenue growth. So we think our existing business is okay. But all the business that we own, and the reason we bought Scripps is, like us, we own all that IP globally. And so, as, as you were saying, this ability to go over the top or reach consumers directly, you have now Facebook, 2 billion people. You have Amazon with 60 to 80 million people on Prime. You have YouTube as a global platform. You have Apple as global. You have four players. These are four massive distributors that exist, this has never happened in history. And so one of the things that we think is we have our traditional ecosystem. We could then go directly ourselves, which we're doing. We're doing with Eurosport and we're doing with, uh, with our car content around the world. We're going direct to consumer ourselves. But then you could, we could also, as can a lot of other content owners, but we may be one of the few that could do a deal with a major distributor and offer that content in 48 languages globally. So if you wanted to offer, a, offer an existing package of content everywhere in the world, how many of the media companies can do it? We've quietly been aggregating content so that we have the ability to do that. And we also think, you know, apropos of CES, that it's not just going to be delivery of content traditionally. You know, this, this whole idea of Alexa uh, and Siri and being able to activate content by asking for it, we think that you can go into your kitchen and say, uh, I want the crown, and it'll put it on your TV. But imagine the largest library in food and cooking, and going into the kitchen and aligning maybe with an Amazon, and being able to say that you want, uh, you want uh, cinnamon apple pie. And not only do you get content related to it, but Whole Foods can deliver that content directly to you within three hours. And the kind of content that people would want when they're, when they're trying to figure out how to fix their car, or how do you put together a, par, a, a bench, or what about a particular science experiment? We own a, a wealth of this superfan nonfiction content that we think will do very, very well, not just in terms of taking advantage of the global platforms that exist to decommoditize those, but also to take advantage of this voice activation uh, which we think is going to be a very big way that people consume content uh, in the years ahead. David, let me just tell you, uh, it, in our house, my wife, Ronnie, took control of the voice-activated device. I walked into the kitchen and said, I'd like a uh, uh, raisin and uh, apple pie, and Alexa said, have you lost your mind? So I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but, but that, that's a, a conversation that I think is so relevant to how brands either matter or don't matter in the future, because we've said for years that something that uh, the consumer packaged goods understood very early was that final moment of truth in, in the supermarket or the drugstore where he or she would pick the product, put it in their basket. That was shopper marketing. Today, shopper marketing is going to be in a voice activated. But, but in the old days, the question was, or on the other side of the ledger, how ent entertaining is that particular piece of content or show? You could look at, at the brands that we own and say, you know, whether it's in science or whether it's in food or whether it's, you know, it w if we can close on scripts, it would be they've aggregated the best experts in those particular areas. So you have the best cooks and the best bakers. In science, we have the best scientists. And so as you look to aggregate this technological connection of IP and the ability to cut it up and have it be serviceable or usable, there's a real advantage. You also have the best sharks. I mean, let's, let, yes, you know, right. yeah, that. <laughs> can't forget but, that. But I think the voice activation point, I think, is a great conclusion because that's a new way of getting the content. But there, in a lot of ways, the music industry, which has been going through this evolution for a lot longer than video, is healthier than video today because it's much more... They've adjusted, first They've adjusted. It's clearly understood. There's a lot of good tension between just a few platforms reaching the consumer. I mean, you have Google, Spotify, Apple, and a few others that will eventually consolidate. But in video, you have a lot of different platforms trying to reach the consumer. I read a statistic the other day that... Um, and there's a lot of clutter, by the way, around that content, that 
the Statue of Liberty is about 300 feet tall, 305 feet tall. The average person using Facebook on, a, in an, on an average day scrolls through 300, 300 feet of content. So basically, picture yourself going to the Statue of Liberty. That's the content the average person uses every day on Facebook alone. So brands are going to be important to get out from under that. And obviously, scale will be very important to be able to demand that consumer attention. Otherwise, you're going to get too cluttered and disenfranchised people. So I, I want to go back to sports for a second. David, you've obviously, by your actions, kind of shown your cards on the question I'm about to ask, which is, you know, who's going to win the battle for sports? You, you, you mentioned the, the, what, what, the acronym FANG. I mean, you talked about Facebook, Apple, uh, you know, Amazon, Netflix, Google, etc. You've made a substantial bet on sports, right. and, and yet everyone is questioning where is sports going to end up? Who's, well, who's going to win that? Sports has been played here really to the point of... Uh, it's, it's over-indexed all of the economics out of the system here in, in the U.S., and it's the, it's the leverage behind retrans, it's taken the majority of the money in, in, in cable, um, and uh, really, it was, a, it was a very effective business use of that IP. That hasn't happened yet in Europe. So we have two to three sports channels in every country with Eurosport, and we've, we've been using those channels together with our 10 channels in every country to create a package. We enhance the IP on Eurosport by buying the tennis, the cycling, uh, all the winter sports, the Olympics. So we invested several billion dollars in sports IP, but we did it really with an, with an eye toward getting direct to consumer, which is critical for us. So yes, we can be profitable with Eurosport across Europe with a leader in sports. Yes, we can, it'll help us grow our revenue streams in the traditional universe. But for the last two years, we've been going aggressively at a direct to consumer product. Just like Netflix is, is drama and scripted, you know, for in, in Europe, we have a sports Netflix. And we've learned a lot. And one of the things that we've learned is an aggregation of a lot of sports is less powerful than giving somebody a season's pass to all of the, a particular sport. And so one of, the, one of the takeaways for us is we don't need to own everything. If for people that love cycling, if we can give them all the cycling, for people who love tennis, if we can give them all the tennis or squash, or winter sports, the way people would buy a magazine when we were growing up, the ability to pay eight, ten dollars a month and get all of the squash or all of the tennis or all the cycling could be a really big business. And again, once you, once you can aggregate a substantial amount of subscribers that are, that are super fans of a particular product, uh, you, you then can do all kinds of stuff with them, with advertisers, with product. But it's not different than trying to do a science product everywhere in the world or trying to do a food product everywhere in the world. That's our whole strategy. Super fans that are willing to pay, just like we did growing up for a golf magazine or a tennis magazine. So looking at the regulatory landscape, and, and not the M&A landscape, because we could spend the rest of the day talking about uh, that. I'm talking about net neutrality. Um, an important statement made, obviously, uh, it, you know, at the end of last year. Is it good for traditional TV? Is it, you know, is it the end of the world? I mean, what, what do we think in terms of content and distribution and programming with uh, net neutrality? I mean, I, I think net neutrality has become a political hot, hot ball or football because, I mean, it was over-regulated, I think, during the last administration, and now it's going probably the, to extreme the other way. And there's going to be eventually some happy medium. I think right now it's become very political. I mean, the fact is I think the marketplace really does work, by and large, from what I've seen. Uh, I think the bigger issue besides that neutrality on the regulatory front is the broadband connectivity. I mean, in Europe, uh, most countries have national broadband providers. Here we have regional providers. We have major gaps in the system in the rural countries where only, I think, 50% of the rural population actually has broadband today in the U.S. Think about the railway system being built in the U.S. and having major gaps in the middle of the country. It doesn't really work that way. So we need to, I think, really have the regulatory attention pushed on getting a fully broadband connected country is much more important for high speed and for applications and video than the neutrality debate in my mind. David, would you, would you share that view or? I mean, I, would, I, I certainly share this, uh, the idea, you know, uh, John Malone is close to both of us, talk about, talks about broadband as being this extraordinary product. It's one of the reasons why uh, Mike Fries, who I think is here, went and aggregated uh, so successfully so much cable around Europe and Latin America was those systems were being valued primarily on multi-channel to the home. 
And uh, broadband is, cable is something that you love and that nourishes you and you get excitement from and uh, it's social. But broadband is something that you'll pay for before you'll pay for dinner. And it's just a very, very compelling product. And it's something that ultimately, I think the good intention of the Obama administration was everyone needs that broadband because it's the way you're going to get educated, it's the way you're going to find out what's going on. It's your access to the world and it's your access to really uh, not just to educate yourself, but to, to have an oppor the same opportunities everyone else does. So I think it's a great, it's a great moment for cable, op for cable uh, distributors that have broadband domestically and around the world because that product is just so important to all of us. So we've talked about this uh, for the last couple of years, and I think it's true, and I, I'm certain everybody would agree. It is the golden age of the content creation world. I mean, there's more of it than ever before. The opportunities, uh, you know, the, the promise of the Internet in terms of, and we'll hear from Robert Kinsel later this morning, but the, the opportunity, the democratization, if you will, of content creation, being able to upload by yourself, not having a gatekeeper anymore. The gatekeeper is yourself. Who's the winner and loser in that? I mean, you, you, you're in the business of creating content, David, and, and owning it, as you said, a, a departure from some of your competitors. And REA, you're, you're looking at this through every lens because in the TMT world, you, all the constituents around the table are trying to win that battle. We think, we think it's the golden age of mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to agree, but... Um, the, the, the issue really is curation. With all of the, uh, the, the challenges and slights on basic cable, it is really a terrific curation device. As human beings, we can't, we, we, we can't get comfortable with just a list of content. When, when, when the cable operators domestically and around the world created uh, this opportunity to go and you could have a list of any movie you want to watch, when you get there and there are 500 movies, 500 equals zero. So basic cable works because everybody has their favorite six or eight channels. And the interesting thing is, whether there were 60 channels or 160 channels, people, only, people have their favorite six or eight channels because that's how much they can gestationally uh, deal with. And they figure out what they like and then they know where to go. And for everyone in the household, it's something else. The, the challenge for us going forward is, yes, it may be that you can have anything, but being able to have anything may mean that you have that same confusion as video and demand provided. And so that's our strategy and our hope is that by curating under brands and, and by creating these really deep baskets, we'll be creating places the same way people feel like discovery gets me or food gets me or ID gets me, that that will always be a place that people can go for comfort to say, they're going to curate this for me. They get what I like and I know I can find my stuff there. You know, to the extent that you're going to just go to the web and say what's there, I think that's going to be a big loss. So we have to figure out how to transition from curation on basic and maybe, maybe uh, course correct to having Amazon and Netflix, who are quite good and quite effective, be the, the right side curator. The question is, can we in the media business take our IP and create this middle ground? Yeah, I think, I mean, there is, we're in a transition moment, as David just alluded to. I think the winner has to be the entity or the company or the, uh, the group of companies that, that really access the consumer appropriately. And we only have a handful of those that exist today that have tremendous amounts of value. And I think there has to be a greater alignment between the investment dollars in the programming and the customer receptivity to that content. So for example, Netflix spends $7 billion a year or so in content, and every quarter their subscribers go up around the world. You know, the, cable and telecom companies spend 50 billion or 60 billion dollars a year on virtually the same types of content and every quarter the subscribers go down. And that's not an aligned model and that creates a lot of gaps in the market valuations in points in time, etc. But it also provides a real oomph of entrepreneurial thinking among companies like David to try to realign that consumer offering, which is effectively what Disney's doing as well, to try to get directly to the consumer. I think that relationship has to be understood every step of the way, otherwise it becomes a business model for the sake of it. The, the, the last thing that I think is important is, as effective as uh, some of these aggregators are in, in, in putting together content that you can go to and see when you want, it misses one of the major points which is critical with traditional television. And there will always be this, which is this shared cultural experience. You know, it's one of the reasons why we moved into sports. 
that people are watching this live event. They're going to be watching the Olympics. We're going to South Korea, and they're going to watch for three weeks together. But we still see when we launch a show on TLC or on Discovery or on ID that people want to watch it together, and then they want to go on Twitter, and they want to. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? And to go to go the next morning to the tennis club or to the diner and say, "Could you believe what I saw last night? What do you think about about what happened on on diners and dives?" Or and it is a it is a cultural connection that we have, and it's very different than me calling up Arie and say, "Hey, did you see the crown?" He's like, "Yeah, I saw that. I, that was four months ago." And so there is this shared experience that you get um, on traditional television. There'll be different things that move in and out of it. But we're convinced that a big piece of this is going to be the shared experience, and you still see it in the live ratings and the live plus three. Eighty-five percent of what we do, even today and around the world, people catch up on within three days because they want to be able to be part of the conversation. Same way you read the newspapers in the morning and you don't want to look silly in your first meeting. That's a big piece of what this shared cultural TV does. And nonfiction, which we're a very big part of, is underestimated in that. In that conversation, how many well, newspapers do you still read? I read them. I read them、uh, the same way you do now, <laughs> <laughs> guys. We we we're going to draw to a close on this part of the conversation. But I think one important takeaway is for me, and I hope for the audience, is that brands matter, and 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 certainly in 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 the world that you occupy, David, brands matter. REA, I think you'd agree, and I think that's an important takeaway for all of us. I want to thank you both for joining me this morning, and、uh, and I appreciate the insights, the thoughts, and、uh, all good. Thanks, Mike. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thanks. What I'd like to do now is make a quick transition and introduce Wenda Harris Millard, the vice chairman of MediaLink, who's going to lead the、uh, conversation w- with the group that is joining Wenda, and I'll leave it to her to、uh, introduce you to the folks that we're going to hear from now. So, thank you very much, Wenda. Well, thank you, Michael, Arie, and David, for getting our conversation underway, and we'll pick up the discussion、uh, with this illustrious panel,、uh, who will offer a 360-degree perspective、uh, to the topic.、Uh, it is my pleasure no, no, to introduce our our, our panelists.、Um, let's see,、I've, we've got them in different order here, but、uh, we have YouTube's、uh, Robert Kinsel,、uh, Nancy Dubuque from A and E. And Marcian Jenkins of Comcast Cable,、uh, and we have Charles King、uh, from Macro, and Kristen Dolan、uh, of 605. So here we go.、Uh, the days, as we well know, of audiences tuning into the same show、uh, at the same time on the same network—that、um, is,、uh, that's now history. So with all of these these platforms and choices、uh, that the consumer has, how are you? Uh, combating audience fragmentation. Jump ball. <laughs> well, I would say, it's,、oh, sorry, Marcia, not so much about fragmentation, but people viewing in different places and figuring out how do you see who's watching what on which platform. So not so much about、um, people watching less, but more understanding better what they're watching and where, and looking at the patterns and the opportunities to integrate. Viewership, promotion, and marketing across all of those different viewing viewing opportunities. So, so I'm, I, may, I may have slightly contrarian view. Good, <laughs> like that. <laughs> Which is,、uh, I don't think you should battling, you should battle fragmentation,、mm-hmm. because I, I believe that fragmentation is like gravity; it just is, it and the internet is what ushered it into our world. Which means you should amass as much content as possible in order to satisfy fragmented audiences. And、um, and if you lean into that, then you will likely find a lot of success with getting lots of subscribers, lots of engaged viewers on advertising-supported platforms. So that's what we do at YouTube. We super aggregate a lot of content. I was going to say、content. you know something about、yeah. amassing audience. <laughs> so it, it, it has worked well. Yeah. I mean, it's an opportunity for shows too. I mean, that we、yeah. 
you know, the top 10 shows that are being viewed on our apps and on our, our owned and operated platforms are not the top 10 shows that are being viewed right. on the linear channels. And that to us creates an enormous opportunity in terms of serving different viewers at different times with different tastes and different needs. And when it comes to advertising, you're right though, that one of the great things that television always had was this incredible scale. And so the challenge is, as the very natural behavior happens, that everybody consumes content in different ways and different forms at different times, re-aggregating that inventory so that it can be packaged and sold and the value of it can be maximized is you know, a challenge that I think everybody works on. Um, and a lot of the technology, as an example, that we're developing is about helping content owners re-aggregate audiences establish an identity for them and know more about those audiences and monetize that, that I would say for a company like macro and who's building uh, we look at it where we're platform agnostic and just with the, the, the panel discussion prior to us ending with the importance of brands building that consumer relationship so there's a consistency of quality and voice when you're super serving a particular audience which is what what we do we're super serving people of color and premium content for them, whether it's a short form digital series that we would platform on Facebook or whether it's a two and a half hour long movie like a film like Mudbound that would stream on Netflix. If, when the macro By the way, just a commercial <laughs> message here. <laughs> that is an awesome movie, yeah, so go see you. it. It's so good. <laughs> but the thing is the consistency. When the macro logo comes up, whether it's on a premium cable outlet, whether it's on a streaming platform, whether it's on social digital platform, the quality of the storytelling at the center of it. And uh, as a company that's building, that's what we look to do. And that's how we're addressing fragmentation. So, and any comment, I'm just thinking about the, the cord cutters and the, and the cord nevers. I think they're about uh, 65 million uh, in that audience. And anybody want to talk about the, the challenge of, of reaching that audience? Well, as a former cable operator, I would say continuing to sell broadband is definitely a good way to, to maintain. Um, but yeah, I think it's 62% of households now can stream and watch internet um, or watch content over IP. And, um, you know, it's more about platform shifting than it is about cord cutting. So it, I think it sort of echoes the previous conversation. I like that better, platform shifting. It's just yeah. about making sure that you can reach people with the right content on the right platform at the right time so that their experience continues to be more enriched as opposed to, to fragmented, to kind of speak to Robert's point. And the reality is that more people are watching more video than ever before, in different ways, across different platforms, but it, is, it isn't as though the 65 million aren't watching anything. They're consuming a lot of the same content in different ways. In different so the question is how each of us can evolve our offerings uh, to make sure that we're satisfying those needs. You know, in addition to also serving them appropriately and being where they are, it's also giving them what they want, which is, mm -hmm. you know, part of the reason behind our investment in Vice and in Vice Land and, and making sure that, you know, each generation is going to want their version of entertainment and news and sports and, and they want it produced in their way and formatted in their way and, and, and making sure that you're, you know, not just keeping an eye on that as you tend to your bigger, more established and mature brands, but also bringing new brands, embracing that opportunity when you, when you see something like Vice. Um, but again, it, for us, it always comes back to that brand play. Um, and does the brand stand for something with a particular audience that's valuable to advertisers and to platforms? Yeah. And you've done a lot of work, I think, in, in this area uh, with A&E and getting your, uh, your core channels onto new platforms. and. Um, I know with Sling TV, uh, particularly in Direct TV. Um, so, how are you going to continue to evolve some of those core brands, um, like A and E itself, History, uh, Lifetime, et cetera? You know, I mean, it's something that you do every day. It's A and E does not look like today what it looked like 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Certainly, History does not, nor does Lifetime. So, it is what we do day in and day out. We're in the 18 months, 24 months out business. We're not in the business of today. And we're always trying to sort of guess or second guess ourselves around what we believe might be around the corner. And the proliferation of content everywhere on so many platforms actually just gives us more 
data, more input around seeing trends, recognizing trends, and trying to respond to that not only in long-form content and premium content, which takes longer to produce and air, but also in the way that we're reactive on a daily basis with our brands and being able to use platforms to respond to what's happening in the moment culturally. So on the subject of content, you know, we talk a lot about the, the power of premium content. Does that always mean that that is original content? Is that another way to interpret it? Premium? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I never thought of it that way, but I mean, a, a we are largely an original content company. Um, you know, I think about premium as anything everyone loves, <laughs> yeah. I right? Would, I would agree with Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's either you're willing to pay for it or you're willing to engage with it. It's like those two things. And as yeah. long as one of those happens, it's premium to that user. Charles, you must have a comment on, on that. I look at it that, well, something that you're willing to pay for, but also I, I think quality as well. I think quality of the content as well when we think about premium. No. So as a matter of fact, going into your, I think your, your third year now with Macro. Yes. Um, and you've seen both, both commercial and, and critical success, but um, you're certainly in a very, very competitive environment um, with what you're working on. So how do you sort of evaluate um, potential projects to ensure that they deliver that quality and deliver what, what the audience expects? We think about artists and storytelling at the center of, of all of our decisions, whether it's a web series, whether it's a, a half-hour show, whether it's a, you know, a VR experience that we're looking to develop, or a feature film. Really unique points of view and perspectives and artists, and then really working with them to figure out what's the right platform and the right length of time for the content that we're getting behind. And once again, it's the consistency of the messaging on everything that we're doing within the brand where it's super serving and focused on people of color. Uh, this is an audience that, you know, the fastest growing demographics that consumes more content online and on social media, watches more television, goes to movies more often, and uh, it's an audience that's, um, I think, traditionally been overserved. And if we continue to serve that audience with compelling content that speaks to them in an authentic way, uh, I think that we will be very uniquely positioned in the marketplace that's going through the rapid changes that we're going through. And, and that's really what we do, and we make sure that, that quality, artistry, and storytelling, and compelling content that speaks to those voices authentically is at the center of everything that we do. Robert, I think there are a couple of, of things that Charles just said, you know, on this notion of um, premium is what people, um, what people watch. But do you have a comment about quality? Because that's also a very subjective, um, subjective word, point of view. Yeah, I think it's quite, quite subjective. I think, I think whether Charles or Nancy can tell you, sometimes their most successful shows <laughs> don't cost the most amount of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's really... I remind it, my team about that exa all the time. <laughs> exactly. So it's a very elusive uh, term. I, I really, for me, it comes down to the, those two things. Either you're willing to pay for it, or you're willing to engage with it for a longer period of time, or on a repeated basis. Because that means it's touching you in some ways, the storytelling, the creator, the story itself, somehow it's touching you in a way that it's causing this action from you. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's all about actions, whether paid or free. Is it, Marcin, is that what your thought is as well on, on how to think about premium and quality? I, I think so. And, you know, we talked a little bit about how different audiences value different things. And so at least from our perspective as a company, something that we've been doing recently is trying to become um, much broader of an aggregator and take different types of non-traditionally you know, cable distributed content and intertwine it in our unified set-top box experience uh, for, so a customer can more easily find what they're looking for. And then we've also tried to flatten the UI with a voice remote and kind of make it easier for somebody to find the thing that's best suited to them. I don't know, Wendy, if you saw, there was an article in the Times, I think, yesterday, um, about the proliferation of content, the 474 series, I think it was, that were created this year. And the question for me on premium always goes back to how do you monetize it? You know, if you're a Netflix and you're spending $8 billion a year on content, even the most amazing, you know, content curators and pickers, like I'm on the board of AMC Networks, and this comes up regularly at, at quarterly board meetings about 
what can you monetize, where should you monetize it, what bets do you make, and they, you know, arguably along with A&E, have been some of the best pickers of things that you wouldn't expect to have hit, like Walking Dead. Um, and so when you think about premium content, I think as a provider, the question becomes, how do you ensure that you continue to make the right bets, or do you ultimately, if you're a Netflix and it's not a, um, you know, sort of a loss leader for your, for your other products, the way Amazon Video arguably is, how do you maintain that equation that's going to allow you to continue to create at that level of expense and still monetize your products? So. Well, I think at, at 605, you have a lot of insight um, into uh, how to kind of curate, I guess, or uh, how brands can speak to the, to the right, right audiences. You want to talk a little bit about um, you know, maybe some of the um, best practices there in, in creating both content uh, and advertising? Yeah, we've worked with different, with, you know, we work, work a lot with programmers. They'll look at different content and, you know, we aggregate a significant amount of first-party user data um, anonymized in the right way and we match it up with lots and lots of attributes so we can look at who's watching what in aggregate, what else they watch, what they like, what types of people they are. So even, you know, for a &E, we did a lot of, of looking at the networks and compared to see which networks indexed for different things. Um, Lifetime, for example, index is extremely high for shopping for men's clothing. So on the advertising side, they can take that information and go to an advertiser who sells online, you know, men's clothing and pitch them lifetime because it's a higher indexing. Or, you know, A&E is a network also, um, index is higher for engagement. So when you're thinking about content and advertising within that, you can, you can sell that in as, you know, our, our viewers are more highly engaged. With a, um, with a retailer like Walmart, it's different. So Walmart recently did, um, they had an initiative where they spent about $2.7 billion on internal corporate culture. So they increased employees' salaries, they um, augmented their training, and they really did an aggressive effort to make their experience better for customers. And so they wanted to go out and do a branding campaign talking about their corporate citizenship. And then they wanted to measure, were people who were exposed to that campaign, did they feel better about Walmart, and did they also spend more? So we took first-party data, third-party data, and then all the viewership data and looked at who was exposed to those different ads and were able to go back to Walmart and say there are four different categories of customers, two of whom were actually positively impacted by this advertising. They felt more favorably about Walmart and they actually, on down to a, you know, a skew level, spent more in the store because they were exposed to this. So you can do it for content and you can do it for advertising um, throughout the marketing funnel, both at the brand level and at the call to action level. Yeah, and anybody using that sort of that level of, of data to inform content creation? We are. We're working creation. with Kristen. Absolutely. Right. I mean, I think we'll, we'll, we're trying to take in everything we possibly can. <laughs> I mean, it's the access to the data that, from an independent programmer standpoint, um, we have to get creative and, and work with partners, yeah. you know, both Comcast and Kristen, and, um, and also be smarter about how we dissect what we have. For us, yeah. a great example is uh, we're rebooting the uh, Karate Kid franchise uh, as, a, right. as a series. And uh, one of the strong data points that we had was a billion views of uh, Karate Kid content on YouTube. So we clearly knew that that IP is resonating, resonating with our audience, so it was easier for us to partner with Sony Pictures Television and, and create the series. So it's coming out later this year. So, Martin, you, you were yeah, nodding vigorously there. <laughs> I was just going to say that, um, you know, for us, you know, our customers are the most important asset that we have, and we work hard every day to earn their business. Other than that, our data is. We use it in every aspect of our business, not just to kind of market and acquire uh, additional customers, but a lot to kind of um, monetize uh, advertising. Uh, we use it in partnership with networks uh, like A&E and others in order to kind of figure out how to uh, give to television uh, the characteristics that digital historically has had, a bit more of kind of where you find the right audience, how you target the right inventory, uh, and the right message to that audience, and then how you measure the results on the back end. Uh, and I think we've had, uh, made a lot of progress on that front, and I think it, it creates a, a lot of promise for the platform from a marketing perspective. Can you talk a minute about how, how you or anyone um, uses the data to achieve personalization uh, at scale and therefore offer the, the consumer uh, a better experience through video? At least from our perspective, I'll give two examples. Um, 
One is the use of data together with artificial intelligence and machine learning around uh, improving somebody's service experience. So it used to be your cable broke, you noticed your cable broke, you picked up the phone, you called the cable company, and the cable company would try to fix it. We now proactively monitor much more the experience in the home, can see when something's breaking, and often fix it long before the customer notices. So there's an example in kind of the core business. Um, another one is uh, kind of back to uh, advertising examples. You know, everybody knows of lots of discussion around, you know, I've spent a lot of money on advertising and I'm not sure which half of my money is actually effective. The reality is you can measure attribution around advertising quite effectively yep. uh, by looking at ad exposure data, tying it back to uh, a household, uh, running addressable campaigns against that household, and then seeing the results on the back end that tied to it. And I know uh, we're working with folks like 605 in order to do that, and we're working with networks like A&E in order to do that. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I'm, I'm sorry, Robert. Right, the best, one of the best, easiest examples of that is tune-in programming, right? Because you can run the ad, you can confirm that the person tuned to the show, and then you can look at what types of people tuned in, which ads did they respond to. You can test creative, but it's in the same ecosystem, so you're not waiting necessarily for first-party data, if it's, for example, a targeted retail campaign, then you still have to wait for the, you know, the ROA data from the, you know, from the advertiser to confirm back that the, ad was, you know, the person was exposed to the ad and then they did engage in the action. But even that's getting faster and faster because the ability to just have things right up into the cloud and to have um, you know, the assessments done in real time quickly allows answers to get back, which then allows the advertiser to adjust the campaign you know, in different ways, either changing the schedule or changing the creative. And so it's becoming a much quicker life cycle from you know, uh, the opportunity to test and learn and to keep doing that. And I think you know, we always talk about the benefit of all this isn't just more effective advertising, but it's a more relevant experience for the, for the consumer. So it's not just about it's great to get the right ad in front of the right person, but being the recipient of the ad feels a lot better if you're not, for me, seeing diaper ads anymore or, you know, or hopefully not too soon retirement ads. <laughs> we definitely have used, whether it's distribution partners on traditional theatrical content that we've financed and produced or whether it's short-form content that we've tested on social media platforms, but we, we definitely use analytics and information to target market spends with distribution partners, as well as to test concepts and to see audience engagement from uh, various demographics and to kind of go deeper into content initiatives and where we're going to spend and the types of content that we'll continue to go into. So we'll, we'll marry our, our cultural understanding, connectivity, and relationship with the audience with access to tools, primarily from third-party tools. Uh, but it's definitely a part of what we do as we analyze and think about decisions that we make and, and content that we finance and produce. Robert, did you have a, a comment on that? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, so for us, like if you, if you subscribe to what I said earlier, which is fragmentation is like gravity, mm -hmm. and therefore you need to super aggregate content and have as much of it as possible to serve all these audiences, then you find yourself with a problem on your hands, which is how do you let people to have the most relevant experience with that, you know, when you have so much content, suddenly your blessing becomes your curse. Mm -hmm. So the only way to solve that is through personalization. And, you know, for us it means really recommendations and having our uh, algorithms curate the right experience for each and every user from the vast ocean of content that's out there. And the same thing holds true for ads, as you, you said, right? Having the right advertising in front of the right person uh, is much more impactful and it feels less like an intrusion and more like information. And then suddenly it becomes a very symbiotic uh, experience. So, so there are some extraordinary uh, statistics around YouTube, of course. Um, you have a billion views a day, is that right? Yeah, so, a little bit more. Give or take. Um, but one, one that's really astounding is that over 400 hours of video are uploaded to the, to the platform yeah. every minute. Every single minute, correct. Yeah. So, how do you what 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 keeps creators on on your video platform versus going what what kinds of tools do you um, provide to them sure. um, to to keep them sure so for for the statistics by the way so we have one billion hours of video watched every single day we announced it uh, about uh, six months ago so mm -hmm. so it's quite a lot and it continues to grow and one and a half billion logged in monthly users and audience also keeps on growing 
The, what fuels all of that is uh, a voracious appetite for video and huge amounts of people who have been enabled to publish it. And uh, the, I, I think the reason that peop, people keep going, keep, people keep creating content for YouTube is one, the unprecedented reach. You know, to be able to reach one and a half billion people is obviously very tempting. And, it, and it's, you know, every creator wants to expose their content to as large audience as possible. But um, hand in hand with that has to come monetization. And, and there are you know, a lot of creators on YouTube who have built their businesses uh, purely on our platform and then expanded off of it and, and collaborate with uh, TV networks. You know, Vice is a great example. You know, they have presence on YouTube, work a lot on YouTube. They work with, uh, with A&E, they got an investment. James Corden with, uh, with his uh, show on CBS, he is publishing all of his segments to YouTube. He got broad distribution globally that in fact has created a syndication opportunity for the television show in 180 markets around the world. And then the IP itself, um, Carpool Karaoke, has then created another show for Apple, which has driven revenues to towards, uh, you know, to the production company. So you can see how the platform can enable business in a, in a massive way. So, so I think that uh, continues so long as we continue to expanding the reach, expanding the amount of uh, consumption that we have, making sure it's all done in a way that is um, uh, favorable to advertisers and creators in a way that the ecosystem remains in balance and, and, uh, and everybody uh, continues to be happy. Yeah. So there's a, a, a conversation and activity around um, limited commercial inventory um, and we're seeing a, a, a surge uh, in, um, in viewing on, on ad-free uh, platforms. What, what, what do you all think about that, the whole LC, LCI issue and is this a, is this a good thing? Um, for the content is a good thing for, for the consumer? Is it a good thing for I mean, I brands? I think it's a necessary thing that we're going to have to react and adjust to a consumer's appetite to not want to watch ads. And so we have to do that in many ways, either the format of the advertising, the quality of the advertising, the relevance of the advertising, and hopefully you know, data execution. This is where art and science have to meet. And that, um, you know, it's, look, we would love it if everybody's love to watch ads. That's a great business. Uh, um, I love to watch ads. And in our house, we watch ads too. We play a game right. like guess the product. And so, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's something that I don't think we have a choice but to address in terms of um, the relevance of, of, the, of the products that are being served to audiences regardless of where and how they're watching them. Yeah. And I think you'll see a lot of experimentation. Uh, so, um, Comcast has uh, launched a, and, and kind of made two announcements, one with FX and one with AMC, about making content available in an ad free as an option. Not as the kind of primary viewing approach, but just to see what segment of consumers that becomes kind of more relevant with. And I think a lot of that type of experimentation will continue to happen. Well, you, you've also, uh, at Comcast, um, made a number of efforts around blockchain um, and, and other initiatives that, that your team is working on. Can you talk about that a little bit and, and how that can help um, increase the, the, um, the value of the, of the advertising? Yeah, for certain. So specifically, the blockchain thing that we did was to, um, uh, in partnership with a range of networks and device manufacturers and uh, kind of platforms and even some advertisers, um, we are innovating a way for pools of data to be shared. Um, the reason is that in order to find the right audience and in order to target ads to the right audience, ideally you put together information that different people have. A distributor knows who's watching something. Uh, a network has a very close affiliation with its fan base. Uh, advertisers are know the people that are walking into their stores. And ultimately, in an ideal world, you figure out a way to put those things together. Now, historically, there are a few companies out there that are kind of vacuuming up a lot of data. Um, and they will offer, you know, the ability to give you insights on that data. 
Uh, but ultimately, the data is probably worth more to them than it is in their hands than it is for somebody else. And it's a bit dangerous because data is a competitive advantage. And so the blockchain initiative that we have launched is about allowing people to keep control of their own data. Uh, but to pool it in order to garner insights. Uh, it's early days, but we're very encouraged. And ultimately, it's something that we think needs to happen for the industry to come together and figure out how to break down silos between these data pools in a safe way in order to capture the media value that, that's available out there. I'd also like to add that this is actually a very US or Western world-centric view. Uh, you know, if you look at it globally, there are markets uh, like Brazil, Mexico, uh, India, you know, high growth markets, which are predominantly advertising markets. Mm -hmm. uh, there are mature markets like Japan, massive advertising market, uh, Australia, where the biggest and most expensive programming sports is advertising supported only. Mm -hmm. So like the global view is a little bit different, but at YouTube, this is the core of what we do which is how do we remove friction from advertising and making sure that people actually like watching it, okay, that they view it as information, they, they don't view it as friction. And you know, we were the first company that moved beyond the 30-second spot. We launched a, a skippable ad called TrueView. We don't charge advertisers if the ad is not viewed in, in its entirety. This year, we'll innovate on that even more, and we'll launch TrueView for actions so that you'll be able to react to what you're seeing in the ad and, maybe, and take an actual action to transact for products. And, and then we've also announced six-second bumper ads. We actually have six-second ads, which, by the way, Fox has also embraced you know, as one of their formats, which was great to see. And so we're trying to innovate in ways so that advertisers can get their messages across to all these large audiences who are engaging with all this content, but do it in a way so that it's not viewed as friction. And, and if we achieve that, then we're having great success with it, then I think there is a great future for advertising on, on the internet and for brands to reach their users in ways that uh, they feel really comfortable. Well, I think you know, in, in a, in a data-enabled mm -hmm. uh, environment, um, I think it is going to be very, very good, uh, not only for, for brands, but absolutely for, um, for the consumer. So I think yeah. that, that's very exciting. We have a few minutes left, um, and I, I would like to pick up on, on the conversation uh, that Michael Aria and David had uh, about uh, the implications of some of these very, very large um, acquisitions and, and mergers. Um, certainly, we're, we're waiting for the AT&T, Time Warner uh, situation, but the, um, the Fox and Disney, what, what does all this portend for, uh, for the television landscape? Do you all think that we will continue to see these very large mergers uh, and acquisitions in the, in the coming year? Well, you know, I certainly agree with REA that it's going to be a big merger year, um, but there's also not much left. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think we're faced with that reality. Um, you know, look, you're going to, it's going to be a horiz it's going to be scale for horizontal or it's going to be vertical for integration. Um, you know, for a company like ourselves, it's, it's about, it comes back to brand, and not that that answers the M&A right. um, question, but it's, it's knowing who you're serving, it's over-serving them, and it's being an incredible steward of, of brand, because brand will matter regardless of what platform you're negotiating with, which advertisers you're serving, um, and what consumers that you're exactly. talking to. So, you know, we chose deliberately a long time ago to sort of steer away from the general entertainment um, strategy of, you know, a network that gives everybody a little bit of something and instead focus on, you know, know thy audience and over-serve them like a history or a lifetime or an A&E. And even the decision to not do scripted on A&E was very, very deliberate, that what we were known for was boundary-pushing unscripted programming. And so put your arms around that and, and monetize that and figure that out across everything. And, you know, it sort of ties back to the larger what is the year that we're faced with as scale becomes critical. You know, part of scale being critical is also audience being critical and, and, and having those value audiences inside your portfolio that will matter as the world gets more complicated. Robert, what, yep. do, you, what do you see from an M&A standpoint in the coming year? Um, 
I, I think uh, I think it sort of revolves around three things. One is uh, what Nancy just said, which is uh, aggregation for audience scale, and especially if it's uh, direct to consumer audience. But audience scale is uh, really important. The second one is for super aggregation of content, uh, again to combat fragmentation, and the third one is for simple good old efficiencies. So, uh, so I think. And you can be an aggregator or a curator, and right. we're choosing exactly. the curator route. Yeah. yeah. So I think area is right uh, that this trend will continue, and um, and um, you can always pick any of these three themes, and it will fit into one of those. <laughs> there you go. But it's interesting I, to see. I'm sorry. Okay. Like, what brands will survive, right? And so it was funny in the office when Scripps was being acquired, our interns did a project this summer and they looked at somebody that was looking to acquire all the Scripps networks and they matched all the viewership together. And they came back and they were so excited because they said, well, everybody watches both. And they're like, isn't that great? And I'm like, no, that's oh, not good. No, that's not good. <laughs> you don't want that because you're buying it, so you're hopefully buying different audiences. So to watch and see which brands will survive and how the ecosystem changes with aggregation and are, it, do you really need multiple brands or can you start to consolidate, which makes what you do so interesting because you're aggregating around a specific promise and a commitment with your content, so perhaps the opportunity to build your brand becomes that much more opportunistic because you're doing one thing and you're doing it really well. Yeah, and just thank you. And uh, to, just, just to add to that, I agree. Uh, I think the generalists are going to have harder time uh, in this in, in bottled, uh, quite rapidly changing marketplace, but those that are being forward thinking and strategic and are finding the right partners and aren't just bulking up just for the sake of bulking up and just for an M&A to get bigger, but it's also partnering with, uh, with organizations or companies that have a complementary skill set or understanding of an audience that they may, may not have or, or access to tech component that, that, they, that they don't already have even though they may have a brand. And I think the other thing I see is tremendous opportunity for the smaller kind of mid-sized companies that do have, that do super serve and that do have an audience that do have a brand with, with